standing here in front of you holding this slightly strange looking piece of rock and you might be thinking to yourself, why is he holding this slightly strange piece of rock? <clears throat> so, I'm not a geologist, but I'll tell you a few things that I know about this piece of rock. The first is, it's actually not a rock. It's an accretion. It's called a polymetallic nodule, and it formed at a depth of 4,500 meters in the deep Pacific Ocean. The second thing I'll tell you about this nodule is that it grew very, very slowly. Uh, it grows at the rate of about a centimeter every million years. So this particular nodule is about 10 million years in the making. And then a third thing I'll tell you about this nodule, given the theme of the event uh, today, is that it comprises about 28% manganese, 1.5% nickel, 1 to 1.5% copper, and about a quarter percent cobalt. Now, these four minerals are central to the way that we operate in modern society today. And in particular, the nickel and the cobalt are hugely important for the current technology for power storage. A recent report by the World Bank stated or predicted that by 2050, the demand for nickel and cobalt for electric vehicles will go up by about a thousand percent. I'll tell you another thing about this nodule as well. It's not alone. There are literally trillions of these nodules on the deep seabed. So between Hawaii and the west coast of Mexico, there is six times more cobalt and three times more nickel in the nodule fields there than the entirety of all global land-based reserves. Okay. So, a pretty interesting nodule, right? Now, the history of nodules goes back to about the 1870s. Uh, they were first discovered by uh, missions such as the HMS Challenger that set out through the global oceans and sampled the seafloor. And everywhere they went, the Indian Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, when they sampled the seafloor, they brought up nodules such as these. So the mineral content of these nodules was tested, and in the 1960s there was a book called Mineral Resources of the Ocean, and it painted a picture of nearly limitless supplies of minerals from resources such as this in the deep ocean. And this led developing nations at the time to call for these resources to be deemed as the common heritage of mankind. Okay. So that means that you or I own this nodule as much as anyone else on the planet. Now, if you like modern history, there is a fascinating story from the 1970s. The image I show you in the background here is a vessel called the Hughes Glomar Explorer. This was perhaps the most expensive and secretive CIA covert operation on record, or off record, I guess, if you're CIA. Um, this ship was built under the guise of a prototype polymetallic nodule operation. Uh, it took about three years to build. It sailed out to the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, but in fact, it was doing no such thing. In true uh, James Bond style, it actually had a huge bay of opening doors on its base, a giant claw that went down, and it was actually out there to try and recover a Russian nuclear submarine that had sunk in the late 1960s down at 5,000 meters in the Pacific Ocean. But of course, at the height of the Cold War, you couldn't exactly just go out and recover a Russian nuclear submarine without causing a lot of trouble. So then in uh, 1982, uh, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea was established, and then this led towards, in 1994, the establishment of the International Seabed Authority that governs resources of the seabed in international waters in the deep ocean. That's about 65% of the world's oceans and a majority of the planet's nodule supplies. Now, how does this all work? Um, so the International Seabed Authority uh, assigns uh, licenses to explore the deep ocean uh, 
The area that I'm showing you here, this is this Clarion Clifton zone between, uh, you can see Hawaii up to your uh, right and the west coast of Mexico to your left. And the color map there is the 17 licenses that have been granted to explore these resources in the Clarion Clifton fracture zone. There are governments there, so this is China, Japan, Korea, for example. Um, but there are also private contractors from Belgium, the UK, and Germany. And so they've been granted a license. It's 150,000 square kilometers that they are allowed to survey. They divide that in two, and the International Seabed Authority determines which half goes to the contractor and which half goes to a developing nation. So the contractor with 75,000 square kilometers uh, will then explore that in more detail, and it's expected that a contract would operate on about 10,000 square kilometers over a lifetime of 20 to 25 years for a mine site. So for context, 10,000 square kilometers, that's about 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers squared, if it was all in one place. That would constitute about 0.2% of the size of this clarion clipton fracture zone, which itself is about the size of the United States. And what I should also tell you at this point is that there are other mineral resources in the deep ocean that people are looking at. There's what's called seafloor massive sulfides. Uh, those are hydrothermal vent systems that are very rich in minerals because of the hot water that comes up from the Earth's crust through them. And there's also what's called cobalt crusts. These are the top of seamounts, essentially underwater mountains, and as you can tell by the name, they're rich in cobalt and other minerals. And these all come over the term, under the terminology of deep sea mining, uh, and they have commonalities, certainly in terms of concerns about the environmental impact, but the mining techniques are very, very different in the case of the cobalt crusts and the seafloor massive sulfides. You actually have to dig these things out the ground. As you'll see with the nodules, uh, you essentially have to go and figure out a way to pick them up. So for the rest of this talk, I'm really going to focus on the nodules because that's where most of the activity is taking place right now. And also, that has the highest potential to impact global supply. So what will a nodule mining operation look like? So this is an animation giving you an idea of what would take place. This is a surface operation vessel that will be built. Um, for context, uh, you're talking about $1.5 to $2 billion to build this operation, this vessel at sea. Um, here's the collector vehicle being lowered off the side of the vessel, and it will be slowly lowered down to the deep sea floor. It would take about several hours, four or five hours to do so. You're traveling literally four or five kilometers vertically downwards. So it would make its way, and it would land on the seabed, and once it gets there, its task is to drive around and pick up these nodules. Now, there's different mechanisms that people have looked at to try and pick them up. The one that is the most used or uh, considered is a so-called hydraulic mechanism, uh, essentially using fluid jets to pick up the nodules, uh, kind of like a vacuum cleaner, essentially, uh, on the deep sea floor. And it will drive around uh, picking up these nodules, and it will also pick up the seabed, the top 5, 10, 15 centimeters of the seabed. So that will pass through a collector vehicle, and it will uh, put the sediment that it doesn't want at the back. And then the nodules, which are what it uh, seeks, will be pumped up to the surface uh, via riser pipe. And you can see these large sediment plumes that are created, and so that's something we're going to talk about in a moment. So the nodules travel up to the surface via this riser pipe, again, going back up four kilometers. There'll be some sediment that still goes up with them. So the other role of the surface processing vessel will be to clean the sediment off the nodules. The nodules themselves will be put into a transport ship and taken to land for processing. And then the unwanted sediment uh, from the cleaning process would be returned back to the ocean. And there's an open question about whether you'd think about doing that by discharging at depths of 1,000 or 2,000 meters, or whether you take that sediment all the way down to the bottom. So that gives you a picture of what a proposed nodule mining operation would look like. Now, again, none of this exists at this point. This is all conceptual and in trial stages. Now, proponents of DC mining 
advocate several reasons why you might think about doing this, going to the deep ocean. Now, one of these is that uh, the current distribution of minerals is wherever it happens to be on land. Um, for example, 60% of the world's cobalt supply, roughly, comes from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So that is hardly democratic, and if you read the media, of course, there's a lot of reports about the use of child labor, etc., in artisanal mining. So that's not very good. That's something that the seabed mining under the governance of the UN uh, with international regulations, could this do, this do a better job? The second is with land-based mining, um, resources are getting depleted. Um, the most abundant mines, so-called sulfite mines, um, are the ones that people, of course, have targeted first. Uh, and so now, mining companies are going after more challenging so-called laterite mines that have more environmental impact than a sulfite mine. So all of the mining that we currently do, essentially, is done on land. Should we move some of it to the ocean and take some of the burden off land? Another argument for deep sea mining that's put forward by proponents is that this nodule contains four minerals in one. So you're essentially doing a mining operation that's four in one. A typical land-based mine would have a primary product and maybe a secondary product. But by doing four in one, are you saving having several mines in case of just having one mine? And then the last is from the international sort of global supply chain in that, again, rather than having one or two countries or entities that control a global mineral supply, um, all these resources lie in international waters. They're governed by the United Nations. This can be handled and distributed in a more societally and internationally responsible manner. So, right, at this stage, the picture seems somewhat clear. We go to the deep ocean. Uh, we gather up the nodules that we need to decarbonize the economy and circular economy for the planet uh, and be socially responsible in the same process, right? So I told you I'm not a geologist. Um, I'm also not a biologist. Um, but what I'll tell you is something else that I know about these nodules. And that is that there is life in, on, and around the nodules. So despite the inhospitability of the deep ocean, how dark, how cold, how much pressure is, there is down there, life exists and has evolved. The movie you're seeing now is showing some examples of the so-called macrofauna and megafauna that are found in the deep nodule fields of the Clarion-Clifton fracture zone. Now, the density of life in the nodule fields is very, very low in comparison to land-based resources uh, and land-based ecosystems, save, for example, something like a Sahara Desert-type environment. And a great deal of the life that exists is not necessarily in the form of the macrofauna and the megafauna that you see here, but in terms of benthic bacteria that live in the sediment and in the nodules. But the life that's evolved down there is also very diverse. There are very large uh, length scales. Um, there's very slow evolution, very slow development down there. So what you get in location A and location B can be very different. Also, the environment down there is very, very pristine. So the natural sedimentation rate in the deep ocean is one millimeter every thousand years. So that means a nodule like this will maybe see a few pieces of sediment landing on it over the course of a year. And, of course, again, being inhospitable, difficult to access, um, it's a little studied part of the planet, right? The Clarion-Clifton zone has been much more studied than other locations because of the interest of deep-sea mining. But every time expeditions go down there, new biology is discovered, new things are learned. So, of course, a huge concern with a deep-sea mining operation is whether you go down to the deep ocean and impact something that we don't even know is down there yet. So we have this picture of a deep-sea mining operation uh, of the vehicle driving around, uh, picking up nodules, 
uh, and discarding sediment at the back. Now, in the direct mining area, this sort of 100 by 100 kilometer region, say, over the course of 20 years, the impact, of course, is going to be very high. And I don't think there's any reasonable expectation that any life that exists in that area will survive. That will be lost. Okay? And as sort of evidence of that, what you're seeing here is an image of a collector track from a trial operation that took place in the late 1970s. Okay? And this image was taken a few years ago. So you can see the collector track is still there. Uh, 40 years later, and the nodules, of course, we know, take millions of years to grow. So there's no nodules in that track where they were picked up by the collector. So uh, the concern is that um, you go down to the deep ocean and you create these collector tracks, and it's not just where the immediate impact is that we're concerned. Uh, it's also that... Um, these operations kick up these sediment plumes and whether the impact will extend beyond the region of the mining site and how far will that go. And a key concept in considering whether a deep sea mining operation is a viable entity is that you have to have these protected areas where they have two properties. One is that you can say that the biology of this protected area is essentially the same as the biology of the area where the mining site is, so that if you act on that mining site, you haven't lost any biodiversity of the deep ocean, it's there. The second thing you have to be sure is that the sediment from these activities would not spread to your protected area. So I've already confessed to you that I am not a geologist and I am not a biologist, so what's my role in all this? So I'm an oceanographer and an engineer, and my role is in studying and understanding the dynamics of the sediment plumes that would be created by a deep sea mining site. So I think your fair natural question to me at this point is, how far will the sediment plumes go? And my answer to you is, I actually don't know the answer to that yet. So there have been estimates, there have been models and some studies over the last 10, 20 plus years. And estimates have ranged from several kilometers to scales up to 100 kilometers. The uh, degree of uncertainty uh, that we have is because the properties of the sediment, etc., are so challenging to understand and to model and to get the data from the deep ocean is very difficult that to make a model prediction uh, is quite challenging. Now, what I can say is that we'll know a great deal more on the time scale of the next year or so. If I come back to this uh, previous slide that we had of the mining site, um, that's actually the only real data point that we have uh, in terms of how far things go. So that uh, prototype operation, they measured a detectable signal 15 to 16 kilometers away from the test mining site. But that data actually raises almost as many, if not more, questions than the answer it gave you there. Because the signal it detected was about twice the background level of sediment in the deep ocean. So I've already told you that the background level is incredibly low. So two times the uh, background level is still something incredibly low. But how does the biology re uh, react to that? Is that a problem for the biology or not? Also, that operation uh, that occurred, uh, it did not put any thought or design into trying to minimize the sediment plume. At that time in the 1970s, uh, the real effort was to try and just collect nodules. So if some thought were put into the engineering design of the system, could you do a better job of constraining the plume? So, like I said, we will know a lot more in the next year because a European contractor uh, is going to conduct trial operations at two sites in the deep Pacific Ocean in uh, two locations, one in uh, a claim uh, due to the Bel country Belgium, the other due to the German area. Um, and our group at MIT, the Environmental Dynamics Lab, 
uh, will collaborate with a large cohort of uh, European scientists to put instrumentation into the water, monitor that trial, which is essentially the first one, substantial one, in about 40 years, and get the data to tell us what the sediment plumes are going to do. So, if you hadn't heard about the profoundly important topic of deep sea mining, uh, you now have, and you can understand that uh, its future is currently playing out on the global stage. I've shown you here uh, articles that pop up almost weekly uh, at this point, discussing the pros and cons of deep sea mining. Should we do it or should we not? So, Will deep sea mining be better or worse than land-based mining? The answer is we don't actually know at this point. Um, there's a bigger overarching question that is driving deep sea mining, or the thought of deep sea mining, which is what minerals, or more specifically, what new minerals do we really need as a society in the coming decades? And as those questions are being answered, and with the likes of the World Bank painting a picture that in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, there is indeed going to be a substantial increase in the demand for minerals such as these, time is ticking on many fronts. We have to make decisions about whether we're going to get more electric vehicles on the road. Uh, the International Seabed Authority itself is in the process of developing regulations for exploitation uh, in consultation or amongst all its member states. And I should add that the United States of America is not a member of those conversations directly because it has not ratified the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. So will deep sea mining be better or worse than land-based mining? I don't know. Um, what I do know is that this small nodule and trillions of others like it have brought to the fore these profoundly important questions about what society is going to do in the coming decades to simultaneously deal with a growing population on Earth whilst transitioning to a low carbon and societally, societally more responsible economy. What we know is that there are costs either way. Okay? There are clearly costs if we go to the deep ocean and collect these nodules. It will impact the environment of the deep ocean. But there are costs associated with not giving consideration to do with it. That could impact our ability to transition to a carbon-free economy. It will leave all of the burden of getting whatever minerals we need on land. So these are tough decisions. These are tough questions. And the answers to these questions have to be based in terms of using science and data to produce informed decisions. A key tenet of consideration of deep sea mining is the precautionary principle, which says that the burden is on the proponent of the activity to show that the activity itself is very unlikely to cause serious harm. So, Will deep sea mining go ahead or not? Will it be worse for the environment or better than the environment? Um, we need to find out. Uh, our task is to determine which of these activities, be it land-based mining or sea-based sea mining, which of these activities will be the least harmful for the planet to achieve the future goals that we want for our planet. Thank you very much. <laughs>